Welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Allie Armstrong. I am a field marketing specialist for Axonics Therapy and will be moderating this webinar. This evening, Dr. Angleg will be speaking about bladder dysfunction, the common symptoms patients experience, and treatment options that may help you regain control. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Anglade. Uh, good evening. First of all, Allie, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, and thanks everyone for taking a little bit of time out of their evening to talk a little bit how, uh, about how we can uh, control your bladder and bowel. For those who don't know me, I'm Dr. Anglade. I'm sitting here in my Duluth office in front of this beautiful George Urology sign uh, to have a little um, informal, but hopefully informative conversation about bowel and bladder control. Um, uh, this talk is uh, being sponsored and, and uh, arranged by Axonix and Allie, who I've known for many years. She does a wonderful job, so I appreciate the opportunity to speak to many of my own patients as well as patients who are interested in, in what I have to say. So um, first, a little bit about me. I'm Dr. Anglade. Um, you know, I've been here in the Lawrenceville sort of Gwinnett community for 20 years this August. So it is kind of amazing to know I've been in this community for so long, but uh, I've seen it grow, I've seen it change. However, a lot of the same conditions that I started treating when I was a brand new green urologist in 2003 are still prevalent. However, what's um, most important is that now we have newer, more effective treatments that are available to my patients or to our patients, which uh, are very well tolerated and really have been instrumental in improving quality of life. So anyway, uh, born in New York, born and raised. Um, I am a big Yankees Giants fan. Still enjoy watching my Knicks lose uh, yesterday to who they play last night. Uh, Geez, I can't remember who they played last night, but, but sorry to see them lose. Uh, anyway, to make a long story short, I got my medical degree in Brooklyn, New York, and then I completed a residency at Boston University for many years, uh, where I did some additional training in male infertility, sexual medicine. Then I came down here to Atlanta, where I became more involved in uh, urinary incontinence, uh, overactive bladder, uh, urinary function, and that's kind of where I find a lot of my time is being spent and it's being spent both in the male and female end of things. But anyway, with that being said, I do see patients in our Duluth office, in which um, I am right now, in our Lawrenceville office, which is brand new. I hope we've, some of you have had an opportunity to either see it or be seen in it, and that's uh, right on Lawrenceville Swanee Road. And still in the office where I first began my career 20 years ago, I still see patients in Snellville as well. So with that being said, hope we have an opportunity to see you, to help you out, as Ali said, this, this sort of webinar is not meant to diagnose individual conditions, but speak uh, to overactive bladder, urinary incontinence as a whole. All right, so we'll go to the next slide. Uh, there's some safety information that's provided by Axonix about their, their therapy for uh, bladder control. I'll speak specifically what sacral neuromodulation means. And, um, you know, if we get further in our discussions, we can talk about... Uh, any kind of uh, contraindications or warnings to the technology as it becomes available. And then with any technology out there, there are precautions, there are risks, there are adverse events. And those kind of issues would be discussed by myself or any urologist before wanting to do uh, any of these procedures on, on patients. So anyway, when we talk about bladder and bowel symptoms, and I'm supposed, uh, going to focus mostly on the bladder, you know, these devices are helpful for bowel as well. However, for the most part, I leave those discussions up to uh, gastroenterologists, colorectal surgeons. So I'm going to spend most of my time discussing the bladder. And as the bowel slides go come up, I may kind of gloss through them, but we'll talk mostly about our, our bladder issues. So anyway, bladder issues can be kind of uh, distressing. Now, most people won't die because they go to the bladder very to the I'm sorry to the bathroom very frequently however it can really be a quality of life situation because if you're always thinking about your bladder always thinking about having to urinate you might drink less and that can have its own issues you might find that you're not sleeping well at night because you're getting up to the bathroom very much and you're drowsy throughout the day 
you feel that uh, you have to be very close to a bathroom. I know many patients have told me in the past that they could tell me where every clean bathroom is between work and home because they've stopped in all of them. So those kind of things, initially they might be um, sort of funny. Might say, ah, you know, you kind of laugh over them. But when they become problematic and you're, you're running back and forth to the bathroom, that really can be a problem. So anyway, uh, you know, this slide says you are not alone and they have the woman looking out the window. But when we talk about these issues, it's not only just females, it's men as well. So when we talk about overactive bladder, it is a common condition. It affects almost 50 million people in the United States. And again, as I said, people suffer from fecal incontinence as well. That's not the major part of my, my uh, um, practice, but again, um, many people suffer from both of these issues in combination. And again, most people just decide I'll live with them. You know, I'll wear diapers, I'll wear the pens, you know, I will change my clothes more frequently. I will not go out, I will stay at home. And um, they cope with it and see it just as a natural sign of aging. And in many instances, it really isn't. So we're gonna go ahead and start talking about what these conditions really mean and trying to educate uh, you know, everybody in the audience about what, what these conditions really are. So when we talk about the bladder issues, okay, first we talk about overactive bladder and urinary retention. Now, most people think if I go to the bathroom too much, that just means I have overactive bladder. In many instances, that's the case. And overactive bladder is defined by a sudden urge to urinate and an inability to hold the controller. So the way I kind of describe that is somebody who says, I've got to go, I've got to go, I've got to go right now. If I don't get to that bathroom right now, I'm going to pee myself. Okay, so that's sort of the person who has, uh, you know, overactive bladder. Uh, you have people who have urinary retention. So case in point, I have patients who come to the office, mostly men, but some women, and mostly men because of a prostate issue. They come in and they say, Dr. Randley, I'm getting up three, four, five times at night. I think I have overactive bladder. But the bladder is actually very healthy. It can hold urine. The issue is, is that you never empty. So the way I like to describe that is if you have a bladder that you can never empty, you've always got some your residual urine left in it. So for uh, to kind of illustrate, if you have a, a bucket that's full of water and you can only empty out half of it every time, that bucket fills up very quickly, and then you need to go urinate again. So they're, they're different although the symptoms of having to go to the bathroom very frequently are the same. And then obviously if you have fecal incontinence, you lose stool without knowing it. So when we talk about normal bladder function, we say the bladder fills throughout the day because drinking water or not, the body will make about 30 cc's of urine per hour. So you can basically not drink for a day and you're still making that amount of urine. Okay, because the body has to filter itself of all the waste products that it creates. So even drinking very little, you're gonna make urine, unless you have obviously kidney disease or dialysis or something like that, but you'll make urine. And the rate of filling depends on your fluid intake. So if you're drinking a lot of water, which hopefully will be drinking throughout the day, or if you drink coffee or anything or beer or something that can be a little bit of a diuretic, you might find that your bladder fills quickly, making you feel like you have to urinate quicker, okay? But the nerve signals are sent to your brain that lets you know you have to urinate. So you're sitting around, you have a bladder that's filling. As long as the bladder can hold that urine, you're probably pretty comfortable. But when the bladder fills, you get the nerve signals are sent from the bladder to the brain telling you I have to pee. And then to urinate, the nerve signals contract the bladder and at the same time relax the pelvic floor muscles. So the pelvic floor muscles are sort of in this area here. And in a woman, they just empty out to the urethra, but there'd be a prostate here in a man. And so uh, in order to uh, urinate, the bladder has to squeeze and the pelvic floor muscles need to relax. So um, again, what is overactive bladder? Overactive bladder, or OAB, is a frequent and urgent need to empty your bladder. And so again, OAB can result in unintentional urine loss. So when we talk about OAB, a lot of times we talk about OAB wet and OAB dry. So someone have overactive bladder and, you know, if I don't get to that bathroom right now, I'm going to pee myself and they're wet, right? Other people may have that overactive bladder where they feel they have to pee all the time, but they can hold their urine. So urinary frequency, urinating usually eight or more times a day. That's sort of by definition. 
It also depends on how much you're drinking. So for lack of, uh, you know, so if you're drinking, you know, a couple of liters of water a day, you may find you go to the bathroom more frequently than others. And that's not a problem if you drink a lot of water. But if you're drinking a normal amount of water and you're going to the bathroom very frequently, that could be defined as urinary frequency. Urinary urgency is a sudden urge to go to urinate that's difficult to control. I get that urge, I get to that bathroom or I'm in trouble. Urge incontinence is when you lose the urine because you can't control that urge, right? And nocturia, as I've sort of described, is getting up to pee more than two or three times a night. And then the other thing when we talk about nocturia, it's that urge that wakes you up from sleep, making you go to the bathroom and having to urinate. And so that can be disruptive in many ways. So what happens with overactive bladder? Overactive bladder symptoms may occur because of an abnormal communication between the brain and the bladder. This may lead to the feeling of an urgent need to urinate and unwanted bladder contraction. You may need to rush to the restroom and even leak or lose urine before you make it. So what I explain to a lot of patients is that we generally have a sensation of when we need to urinate. In some patients, that need to urinate or that signal is very, very strong when maybe it need not be that strong. When you get those signals over and over again, that's when you run to the bathroom over and over again. Now, we're gonna switch a little bit and talk about incontinence. And again, incontinence is the loss of urine. So you can have an overactive bladder and have it be dry, just feel like a pee all the time and not leak. You can have an overactive bladder and be wet, right? And you leak in urine. Now, the leakage of urine is known as incontinence. So some people also leak urine because they leak when they cough, laugh, sneeze, or put movements on their bladder. And that's what we call stress urinary incontinence. And some people may have mixed incontinence where they have leakage because of the stress incontinence where they just leak when they cough, laugh, or sneeze, or leakage because of urinary urgency, which is sort of associated with the overactive bladder. That's called mixed urinary incontinence. So to kind of explain that, uh, again, when I have a conversation with many patients, I say, you know, um, do you have, is your incontinence sort of, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go right now, and if I don't go, I'm gonna pee myself? That's more urgent kind. If you have leakage when you laugh, cough, sneeze, jump up and down, go for a run, that's stress and kind. And many patients will have a little bit of both. So usually when we discuss how to best treat these conditions, we need to get an idea of which is, do you have both? And if you do have both, which is more predominant? Because that may help decide which way to go with treatment. And then again, we talk about bowel function. That's not something I deal with a whole lot, but in general, you have the rectum that fills with, with stool, and then you need to be able to control your stool. And then you have to relax the bowels to let the stool go. And we'll, I'll skip this slide because we talk about fecal incontinence. Um, and uh, however, they are, both, they are both connected specifically because they're, they're stimulated by the same nerves and you need to be able to relax that pelvic floor muscle to be able to urinate as well as to defecate. You need to be able to relax that muscle to both, you know, poo and poop or pee and poop. Reason being that the musculature that helps to control both the rectum and the bladder are kind of in that same level of muscle. So um, we'll get a little bit into more of that during this talk, but they're, they're, they're connected. And um, to explain a little bit better, that's why it's difficult to sit down on the toilet and defecate and not urinate or vice versa. Because in order to let the urine go, you're generally gonna relax the rectum to let stool go. So they kind of go hand in hand. So, we're gonna go back, take a step back and kind of explain that when you have these conditions, they impact your quality of life. They may, may limit your physical activities. You know, you may not wanna go running or, or, or jumping or like, I like to run. You may not wanna do that if you're leaking on yourself. You may not want to go to parties. You may not wanna sleep at your, uh, 
you know, your, your in-laws or your, or your, or your children's homes because you're afraid of messing the bed or something like that. So you may, may not want to go to hotels because of concerns about uh, urinary leakage. It may feel bad. You may have psychological issues. You know, uh, you know, I, I can't go out to dinner with my spouse because I'm running to the bathroom all the time. Um, I feel concerned about taking a trip because I, I don't feel like I'm riding a plane without getting in and out of that middle seat and, and, and going to the bathroom all the time. So uh, we talk about sexual issues. I don't feel like making love to my spouse because I'm afraid I'm gonna have a, an, an, an incontinence episode, either fecal or urinary. Um, you may find that you can't go to work because you're uncomfortable sitting at work with, with wet pants. So, and then the other thing is that I'm not sure if they even mentioned in this slide, there's a lot of cost that goes along with you know, wearing pads and diapers and so forth. And that over time can be problematic. So when we, we take all that into consideration, how it can be, how it can cause psychological distress, how it can be expensive, how it can affect your relationships, how it can affect your day-to-day -day living, you know, we get to the point where we say your condition is not something that we can't treat. It's not a normal part of getting older. It's not a part of being a man or a woman, not just an issue with the prostate. And specifically, it's not caused by something you did. And what we have the benefit of is treatment plans that can be beneficial. So again, good news are treatments that can help you control uh, bowel and bladder. Treatment options. Okay. So first of all, you want to come and see me or one of my colleagues, George Urology, because we're urologists, we treat this, and we'd love to help our patients with these issues. And so you're going to find a patient care pathway, and we're going to, have, we're going to take you through a pathway to help figure out what makes sense, what treatment options we have, what treatment options we can discuss, and uh, you know what works best for the individual patient. So you'll come on in and generally when I meet a patient, I uh, ask them about the symptoms. Again, I kind of get into the overactive bladder, the overactive bladder wet, overactive bladder dry, the urinary retention, those kind of issues. We ask what kind of surgeries you've had, what medications you take, so on and so forth, right? And then we, we, we discuss what our, what, our, what our baseline treatment tests would be and what our options would be. In many instances, I might say, well, you know, it sounds like your symptoms are fairly mild. Why don't we try some bladder training exercises? Let's try some lifestyle changes. Um, let's try some medications, okay? Because they can work. You know, you can try the Kegel exercise for many people who have some, some mild incontinence. You can try not to drink a cup of coffee at 8.30 at night before you go to bed. Um, there are some medications I can prescribe that help to control the bladder. And there's always the, the, that market of medications for overactive bladder treatment are always um, evolving. There are a lot of treatments that are available that were not available just a couple of years ago. And if we find that there are no symptom improvement, that, that things are not getting better, then you go from one step to the next step to the next step. What I would suggest, it doesn't make a lot of sense to go from, you know, zero to a hundred without a, without a complete workup, but you have to see what treatment options are best and taking this stepwise fast. So when we get to the advanced therapies, we talk about sacral neuromodulation, percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, and chemo denervation, which is Botox. And I'll speak specifically about all three of those. And again, when we get to urinary retention, similar workup, we can talk about medications, we can talk about behavioral management, we can talk about surgical treatments. But if none of those make sense, we can talk again about the sacral neuromodulation, intermittent catheterization, where you would pass catheter on a routine basis down to the bladder or surgical intervention. And fecal incontinence, we'll kind of get through that again. I don't do a lot of fecal incontinence, but there are medications for that issue, as well as different sorts of um, minimally invasive procedures that can be done. So the initial treatment for overactive bladder, bladder training exercise, uh, very, very helpful. We try to tell you, okay, don't, when you get that initial urge to urinate, if you can control it, try not to pee right away. You can do time voiding. So if you're one who uses the bathroom very frequently, uh, I say use the bathroom every, you know, every other hour. So a lot of patients I may suggest use the bathroom every two hours, eight, 10, 12, and so on and so forth to try to really train the bladder to get back into a routine. We can do pelvic floor exercises, which are the Kegel exercises. And those are the sort of muscles you contract as you sit here. 
I can be doing them right now and you would never know. Right? But there are muscles that you can contract to help tighten up the pelvic floor. And those are actually quite helpful. Uh, we can change lifestyle, avoid caffeine, avoid carbonated beverage, limiting the alcohol. And those are the kind of things that we can do. And then there are medications that are available. There's something called beta-3 agonists, which are the newer class of medications. Um, and they are very good in the sense that they work very specifically on the bladder and very low in the way of side effects. And they're what are called anticholinergics, the medications are in the type of pill. They've been around for ages. They've had many different types, detrols, vesicares, tobiazes, those kind of medications. And they are helpful, but sometimes they may cause uh, additional side effects. So again, we say when you come on in, let's not straight uh, go to a procedure. Let's see if any of these issues may be helpful. And the one thing I want to mention is that we find a lot of patients will come in for that initial consultation. They may try some medications. They may try some public floor therapy, and it doesn't work. And then they lose hope and don't come back. And that is actually the um, one of the bigger mistakes you can make. If it doesn't work initially, it doesn't mean that we don't have something that will work. But you come back and see the doctor and say, look, it didn't work. Can I try something else? And we go down the line. So there's something called percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. And this is where we use um, a needle that's put by the ankle. And I kind of say it's like an acupuncture kind of thing. You put a small needle by the ankle and we deliver electrical stimulation along the tibial nerve. And that's the same route. So again, if I'm gonna show you here, we put a little needle, an acupuncture needle by the ankle. And by stimulating that tibial nerve, it sends electrical impulses back towards the bladder. And they use essentially the same nerve root. And so by doing this, it's been found that we can sometimes help control the bladder. It's an in-office treatment. Uh, you do it uh, once a week for 12 weeks. And you know, some people will see some improvement within the first six, you know, first five to six treatments. And if it's improved, then a lot of times we can continue the improvement with uh, a monthly treatments. It's worthwhile trying, if you have the time, to come to the office for about half an hour uh, every week. But uh, for some people, it's kind of time consuming, not something they want to do, but it's completely non-invasive, very well tolerated. I would say the one thing that we'd have to look out for is if you have uh, some kind of uh, skin issue or swelling in that area of the ankle, where it'd be difficult to place a needle, an acupuncture needle, to appropriately stimulate the nerve. So then another treatment that, I, that again, and I do all of these treatments, is what's called chemo denervation. And what that is, is where we use Botox to relax the muscle so that it'll keep the bladder from contracting too frequently. So the way it's done, is usually done just under local anesthetic in a surgery center, a small telescope is placed into the bladder and through the small telescope, a needle is used to inject medication throughout the bladder. Now it's just placed right under the bladder skin between the bladder skin and the muscle. And by doing so, the muscle helps to, it helps to relax the muscle so that it's not, um, it's not so tense and it doesn't contract as frequently. But it does need to be redone on a routine basis. So you may have to find you're doing it two or three times a year. And that's probably the biggest downside to something like the Botox. Now, when we talk about sort of advanced therapies, that's where we're talking about the sacral neuromodulation therapy. And uh, that's where we talk about the axonics therapy. Now, the way it's done is that you go to the operating room and under either a deep local anesthetic or general anesthetic, we place a small needle in through what's called the S3 sacral foramen. And through that, I can put a small lead that sits right along the nerve, okay? And the reason why that tibial nerve stimulation works, because it kind of joins this nerve that goes all the way down the leg and they kind of meet up here towards the bladder. And by stimulating this nerve, you can hopefully get some uh, uh, control of the bladder, okay? So the way we do this is to find out if it's gonna be beneficial, we will go ahead and place a trial needle in there and that's done easily just under local anesthetic. 
takes about 15 to 20 minutes in the surgery center. And if it does work, then we can go ahead and consider putting in the permanent implant. So uh, just to kind of talk you through that. So let's say you're a patient of mine, we've done the pills, they don't really work. You know, we've tried the PTNS, the ankle stimulator, it didn't really work. You say, well, Dr. Anglin, I'm not sure if this is the treatment for me. Maybe it's not my nerves, maybe it's something else. I may say, well, uh, Mr. Jones, let's go ahead and try to put this temporary uh, uh, lead in and see if we get some benefit. So let's say you were to agree to something like that. We go to the surgery center and just under local anesthetic, I put a very fine wire into that sacral foramen and place it next to the nerve. And you go home with this device for about a week and see if you're better. I have many patients who come back at the end of that week when we take out the device who want me to leave it in because it's worked so well. But if it does work, then that gives me an idea that if we go ahead and put in a permanent device, we'll get the same sort of improvement. So that's where we get to start talking about the axonics therapy. And the axonic therapy is sacral neuromodulation. What that means is that the stimulation we put through the lead helps to modulate the signals that go from the bowel, sorry, not the bowel, but the bladder to the brain. So here we go. So how does axonic therapy work? Overactive bladder, people in concert or retention may be caused by abnormal communication between the brain and bladder and bowel. So the axonic therapy provides general stimulation to the nerves that control the bowel and the, bl and the bladder. And this stimulation can help restore normal communication between the brain and the bladder and bowel can help result in improvement of your symptom. So the way I like to describe it to a lot of patients is that sometimes there's a lot of noise that goes on between your bladder and your bowel. So you get these, these, these uh, signals that tell you gotta, you wanna urinate all the time. But that sacral neuromodulation seems to help control a lot of that. So it only really lets the significant impulses, the significant signals get to your brain so you sense them. And by doing so, it's almost like a gatekeeper or a pacemaker, I could describe it a bladder pacemaker, so that it, it keeps you from having to feel the need to urinate it all the time. So the first step towards treatment is we try the trial system. And again, it's sort of described here. I place a small needle, a small wire into the, that sacral foramen, that little wire, which is very thin, it's a thin filament. I place it there and then we connect it to an additional device and a sort of remote control. So you have the patient remote control, flexible wire called the lead, small external stimulator. And you wear that for about uh, three to five days and we see if that treatment would be beneficial. And um, we talk about the axonic system. They have both a rechargeable battery and a permanent battery. Those are the kind of discussions we would have if we thought the therapy would be beneficial, but they're both excellent. Small rechargeable battery, you have to recharge once a month, but it gives you 15 years or more. The permanent battery, you don't have to charge it at all. It may be, it may last a little shorter. You may need a, a battery replacement sooner than with the rechargeable one. However, it's been my preference, excuse me, that a lot of patients would rather have the non-rechargeable battery because uh, you know, not having to charge something else <laughs> like your phone and your laptop and everything else makes things a little bit easier. But again, both work extremely well. So the battery is just slightly bigger than, again, taken into context, only slightly bigger than a quarter and it'll last about 15 years or so. Um, what makes this therapy better than what we've had in the past is that it's MRI compatible. Now, um, in the past, we've had implants that were not MRI compatible. So for some patients who have sort of neurological conditions that are affecting their bladders, maybe they've had a stroke, maybe they have MS or Parkinson's or something like that. And they need to have MRIs from time to time to help uh, with assess their progress or um, you know, stability of their disease. It was, almost, it was almost impossible to recommend these treatments, but now that they're MRI compatible, that's not an issue. And then you have this remote control, which is very easy to use. You don't have to use a secondary device. You just have the remote. And again, here they use it as a keychain. 
you know, maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure everybody's different. But with the remote control, you can, if you feel that you need a little bit more control of the bladder, you can turn up the stimulation that comes from the battery. Or if you're feeling that, you know, this is, I'm, I'm feeling it a little bit more than I'd like, you can decrease and adjust your therapy. The charging system is if you I opted for, if the treatment is working and you wanted a, a slightly smaller battery, didn't mind charging it, you'd wear a battery pack on your backside over where the implant would be, right? Sort of right here. And then you would charge this. And once it's charged, you put it over your skin where your internal battery is and allow it to charge the battery. It's usually done about once a month. So almost all patients found charging easy after two years of therapy. It's acceptable, but again, everybody's a little bit different. If you're okay with wanting to charge your battery once a month, that's fine. But if you're like, eh, I don't want to charge this thing. I just want to put it in, set it, and forget it. Then, um, then the permanent battery makes sense. So again, we talk about charging is as easy as anything. You can charge it, uh, and you have a remote control for either one of the batteries. And if you had to use it, it's right there. The other thing I will mention about Exonix and this device is that the customer support is amazing. Being in the industry for almost 20 years now, I found that almost what's as important as the device itself is the customer support that you have with it. So with people like Ali on the team and the other uh, individuals who I work with, I know that my patients are well taken care of. And even if it's not something I can easily answer, the team that has been trained to work with these devices, they're excellent and they take very good care of their patients. So again, when we talk about these treatments, 93% of patients achieve clearly significant improvements at two years. And, I, and I, I feel that's a pretty true statement. The vast majority of patients I put a device in have done extremely well and they're very pleased with their device. So again, two years after the implant, over 90% of patients were satisfied with the results. So again, I think people do well with them. And it's just so fantastic to live a normal life. What I found specifically in patients who have a lot of urgency, urgent continence is that um, it may have gotten, maybe gets them out of diapers, maybe it uh, gives them more confidence to do different things without worrying about running back and forth to the bathroom. And a lot of times what's most important for a lot of patients is they're no longer taking pills. They've been on Detrol and Vesicare and this and that for many, many years, and now they're off of medications and they're able to control their bladders, which is huge. So now we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about another product that Axonix offers and another product that I've found to be very helpful in uh, my ability to treat stress incontinence or incontinence in general. Um, we'll get to it in just a moment, but when we talk again about incontinence, when we talk again about bladder function, your bladder has to be able to hold urine at relatively low pressure. So your bladder is like a is a sac. And as urine goes into your bladder, the bladder starts to expand. And for most of us, we, we rarely feel our bladders that are filled with urine. I mean, you're sitting in your bladder is filling with urine all the time. If I were to show you, if I ever were to do a cystoscopy and look in your bladder, a lot of times I'll show my patients where the urine enters into their bladder, what are called the ureteral orifices, where the urine enters from your kidneys. And the urine will be jetting into your bladder, but you never feel it because your bladder is relatively empty. It's only when that bladder starts to fill and there's pressure that develops in the bladder that you feel the urge to urinate, right? And in some instances, particularly for people who have either a muscular issue or an obstruction issue, as that bladder fills, you don't have enough resistance. There's not enough of this. There's not enough outlet resistance to hold the urine. And when that occurs, you cough or laugh or sneeze, the urine leaks out. So again, when we talk about stress incontinence, we're talking about the fact that either this sphincter muscle or urethra is open. And you don't have strong muscles to tighten this up to hold the urine at rest. So a lot of people will say, well, Dr. Angley, you know, as soon as I feel that first drop or two come out, I can, I can stop it. That's because you can't contract this sphincter muscle to close it. But that most likely means that this internal urethra or this is, is weak. So um, most people or some people can, can stop urine when it first comes, when they have stress incontinence. But again, 
There are many ways where we can try to tie that up. So physical activity, coughing, sneezing, laughing, get to the leak. And stress incontinence occurs when the pressure from the urine in your bladder overcomes the urethral resistance and then the urine comes up. And again, you are not alone. Stress incontinence is a condition that affects one in three women at some point in their lives, but it also affects men. Um, specifically, it affect men who've had either prostate surgery, men who've had some kind of urological injuries, um, and men just sometimes we don't know why they have stress incontinence, but again, it affects both women and men. So 60% uh, of women say their symptoms impact their lifestyle. You know, again, if you're leaking, you might have anxiety about it. You might have to wear diapers or pads. It may limit what kind of clothes you can wear because you're kind of embarrassed about wearing your pad. It can cause skin conditions where you have irritation in that area in your privates and it's uncomfortable. You can have recurrent urinary tract infections and you're leaking urine into a pad or into an undergarment. And because of that, you can have uh, recurrent infections of the urine that's in those undergarments. Um, it can change the way you have sexual relations. You may feel like I don't want to be intimate with my partner because I know I'm going to leak and that's not, that's not good. And, and lastly, and, and actually very important, it has huge economic consequences. They just spend hundreds of dollars if you just go to Costco and see how much the diapers are, I mean, you spend hundreds of dollars on, on diapers and sanitary products for this issue alone. So again, good news. We have good news. There are treatments that can help. So treatment as for stress and is pelvic floor exercises. Now, I, I, don't under, I don't underestimate these. Pelvic floor exercises actually work very well for a lot of people. And so we can go ahead and say, do Kegel exercises. You can look on Google. You can Google it. You can uh, Instagram and they'll tell you how to do good Kegel exercises. And that's a good place to start. But then when, when you try Kegel exercise and they don't work, then you may say, okay, maybe I wanna try something surgical, like putting in a sling, a mid urethral sling that helps to compress the urethra. And by bringing the urethra up and producing a backboard underneath the urethra, it'll keep it from leaking if you cough, laugh, jump or sneeze. And then we also have what we call urethral bulking agents and that's what Exonix has to offer. So, Treatment options for stress and continence, we can find something that'll work for you. Pelvic floor exercise, urethral bulking, surgical sling. Now, one thing I'm gonna mention here is that um, when we talk about incontinence, right? Maybe stress, and specifically here, stress incontinence is I'm leaking urine because I'm putting enough pressure on my bladder that it's overcoming the resistance in my urethra, right? You can have a completely stable bladder, no overactive bladder, good, healthy bladder, and you have stress incontinence. And that happens sort of a lot of times after women have children. They develop stress incontinence because they've had a baby in the pelvis and it's been pushing against the muscles and you have stress incontinence. But otherwise, their bladders are totally healthy, no problems, right? However, there are people who have overactive bladder where it's like, I got to go, I got to go right now. And then they also have some degree of stress incontinence and they leave. So you got to kind of figure out which is which. And once you know which is which, you can figure out how to best treat it. As we mentioned in the beginning of the talk, you have mixed incontinence, both stress and urge. And if you have that, you gotta figure out which one is the most predominant and how do I fix that, right? Is the stress more of a problem than the urge? Is the urge more a problem than the stress? And how do I fix that together? So that's where you do need somebody who has a little bit of experience in kind of looking at these things, doing the appropriate testing, and hopefully trying to figure out which is the best way to, uh, to address both issues. So again, we talk about stress and continence management. You can do lifestyle changes, uh, Kegel exercises, you know, um, you know, you can lose some weight if you're overweight, those kind of things. And, and those all help. And particularly they help when you're younger. But as things get a little bit older, they become more problematic. Some of these things won't work as well. So we can talk about doing a surgical sling or a mesh. Goal is to resupport the urethra. So again, what you do is by putting this mesh material underneath the urethra to help to support it. And by doing so, if you cough, laugh, or sneeze, when that bladder wants to drop, you've got this support underneath it, so it's less likely it'll leak. So 80 to 90% success, 17-year follow-up, still considered the gold standard by many. Women who plan to get pregnant may want to wait until after the last pregnancy to have stress and continent surgery. I agree with all of those statements. Um, uh, slings, I think, are very good. I, I, I used to do more slings than I do now, but I've always found them to be a good, a good uh, procedure. They are, um, 
you know, back again, I'm, I've been in the, in the field for enough time that probably about, uh, I'd say probably mid teens, 15, 17, 18, there was a rash of problems with slings where some of the material that was being put into patients was not appropriate. And there were people having a lot of scarring, a lot of problems, and it was just a mess. And there were a lot of commercials about slings and this and that. And um, we've gotten past that, I think, in many instances. The sling that I use, like to use, the material I like to use, is very well tolerated, a very small portion of sling. So even when you look at this picture here, you have a sling material that goes from um, across the pelvis. Now you don't even need to use that much sling. But slings, again, at the end of the day, they do work. Um, but uh, I agree with this last statement. I would never put them in a particularly young woman because, again, if they have more children, that as the baby sits in his pelvis or as the child comes through the birth canal, they might mess up your sling. So that, that's something I wouldn't do. And then we have, uh, and this is kind of where we go with exonics, is urethral bulking agents. And when we talk about urethral bulking agents, it's where you put a substance underneath the urethra to help bulk it up. And by bulking it up, you help to tighten it. And it works really well, very easy to do for the patient and for the doctor. Um, little, if any, recovery. And um, it's done just under general anesthesia, maybe a little, I'm sorry, not general anesthesia, local anesthesia with some uh, laughing gas. And uh, I found my patients to be very satisfied with it as well. So again, time to say goodbye to your bladder leaks. We're gonna go ahead and try to figure out a way to cure them. So this is the product that they have, it's called Bulkamed. Bulkamed is a minimally invasive non-mesh alternative to free stress incontinence. The Bulkamed is a soft water-based gel that is clearly proven to help or cure stress incontinence. Now the Bulkamed, uh, just before I start this little video, it has sort of the consistency the uh, best way I can describe it is almost like, like snot almost. It's, it's very soft and gelatinous. And when it's injected underneath the urethra, it can form a pillow. And that pillow helps to tighten the way the urethra is. So then it kind of collapses the urethra. So it makes it a lot less likely that you'll have a leakage. So here's a little video that kind of explains it. Volcomid can help provide the relief you've been longing for. The short, incision-free procedure typically takes less than 10 minutes. Involves three to four small injections of soft, water-based gel into the wall of the urethra to help prevent urine from leaking out of the bladder during day-to-day -day activities. It's safe, quick, and most patients can get back to your normal activities almost immediately. All right, so. Vocal medicine and plan to help cushion the urethra, restore a proper seal, assisting with the natural closing mechanism of the urethral sphincter. Similar to a facial filler, it remains in the body over time without causing an adverse reaction to surrounding tissue. So again, yeah, what you would do, or what I would do, I guess, is I put a telescope in here and I put these little pillows in here. And by doing so, it helps to close the urethra. Um, as opposed to some of the other injectables we had in the past, years ago, we used to use something called uh, bovine collagen but people have allergic reactions to it because it was, it was made from, it was taken from cows. So people, some people had allergies to it. There was something called macroplastic, which I used, which worked okay, but it was more stiff. So some people found it to be a little bit uncomfortable. There was Durasphere. So there've always been injectables that have been used in the urethra, but the bulk of it now seems to be a pretty good alternative in the sense that it's easy to use it causes no reaction. I've yet to find a significant side effect from it. And again, I found it to be very effective. So safe and effective, 92% of women reported being cured after Volcomed. Simple procedure, three to four injections, takes about 10 to 15 minutes an outpatient procedure on a local anesthetic. And it is clinically proven to deliver symptom relief. The other thing I will mention about Volcomed, if let's say I put a Volcomed in, some patients will immediately have some improvement. But there's no problem with touching it up a little bit more, let's say a couple of weeks later, if it's not as tight as we want it to be. Because again, you can kind of come underneath what I've already implanted and put a little bit more to tighten you up a little bit more. But again, it works extremely well. So ready for symptom relief, right? So when we talk about getting started, we recommend that you schedule a consultation. And on the last slide that I have here, there'll be a QR, a QR code that you can scan It'll help facilitate making a 
appointment with me or one of my colleagues to help uh, you know, work through um, the therapy and how we can proceed to help with incontinence. Now, um, at the end of the day, I've, I've discussed two treat. well, I've discussed more than two, but I've gone into depth about two treatments, the sacral neuromodulation, as well as the bulk med, but there are many treatments that are available. A lot of new medications that are out here so that um, even if these did not seem like something you were particularly interested in, don't let that stop you from wanting to get the uh, incontinence addressed. And uh, we can try trial therapy and see what works best. So um, again, this is a QR code you can scan. It. I think it brings you to our Georgia Urology uh, webpage and it'll ha help you make an appointment to discuss it with me. I work with an amazing nurse practitioner. His name is John Buchanan. And if you can't per se see me directly and want to get in sooner, you can work with John. But at the end of the day, I think we'll be able to help uh, many patients find the relief that they need. And uh, with that, I'll let Allie get back on and tell everybody, thank you so much for your time, your attention. And I think we have a couple more minutes to go over some questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Anglade. It was a pleasure hearing from you and your experience with treating patients suffering conditions. Okay, question number one, how does over, um, being overweight contribute to OAB? You know, being overweight contributes to so many different issues, right? But being overweight, particularly when it comes to overactive bladder, you know, you're putting, a, your bladder sits in your pelvis. And so that's kind of in a deep area in your, in, your, in your abdomen. And by doing so, by putting weight on it, a lot of times it makes you feel like you have to urinate a little bit more frequently because again, you're putting intra-abdominal pressure, a lot of sort of your body weight on your bladder. So uh, particularly when you're active, if you're heavy, that puts that pressure on your bladder and it can increase that pressure and make you leak a little bit more because again, you can't resist the bladder pressure. So one of the first things we ask if you ha are having or suffering from overactive bladder or particularly incontinence more so, is uh, if you can lose weight, lose some weight, that may help. Thank you. Are the treatment options for OAB and urinary incontinence the same for frequent urination due to BPH? Uh, yes and no. That's what Bivet would answer. Yes and no. So if, first and foremost, a lot of men come in with incontinence sort of issues or urinary frequency, and I'll find that, you know, you find a guy who's in his maybe late 50s, 60s, 70s, and uh, he's been put on a medication like uh, oxybutynin or detrol because he says, I'm getting up too much to pee at night. And generally, that's not the right answer if they've never had anything done to their bladder or prostates before. Because most men, as they get older, their incontinence or their overactive bladder is gonna be due more toward more to a enlarging prostate than to truly a bladder issue. So in those men, I generally err towards addressing prostate and outlet resistance than I do with overactive bladder. And so if you're in that situation, you try to improve the way one empties their bladder with medications like uh, Tamsulose and Psyllidose and Finasteride and not medications that help control your bladder like Detrol or Gemtessa or Mirbetra. Yeah, I'm currently taking medication for my OAB. Is this something that I'll have to stay on my whole life? Uh, generally, yes. So most people, if they find that uh, they have overactive bladder, for the most part, it's a medication you'll have to take for, for a very long period of time. There's some people who are on medication for a long time. You hope that over that time, because uh, the medication have helped control the bladder, maybe you won't need it, or it may be because you have the bladder that's been irritated by infection or irritation, and you can take those medications for a short period of time. But it's been my experience that people have true overactive bladder where that communication before the bladder and between the bladder and the brain is abnormal, that the medications are necessary until that communication improves. So for, for argument's sake, let's say if somebody had a recent stroke or had some kind of motor vehicle accident where they've had a nerve injury or something, in the interim, they may need those medications, but eventually they get off of them. But if it's just because um, you know you develop overactive bladder, a lot of times those medications stay forever. Thank you. 
Um, one of the most important questions, is this procedure covered by insurance? Uh, yes and no. So for the vast majority of patients, I do believe insurance will cover. Uh, again, having done these type of procedures for some time now, I do find that they're being covered by insurance. However, before any of these things would be recommended, I do have a very good, Georgia Urology has the benefit of having a very good reimbursement team. And we would check your insurance and make sure that it's something that would be covered. And if not completely covered, at least give you an estimation of what your out-of-pocket costs may be. Thank you, Dr. Anglade. And um, why do I leak more when standing than sitting? Again, it's sort of a pressure thing. So when you stand up and you go ahead and you, and, and a lot of people say they, while they're sitting, they don't feel they have to pee. But as soon as they stand up, they got to run to the back. And the reason is, again, because now you're standing up and you're putting the gravity and pressure of your body on top of your bladder. And immediately, that's a switch in the pressure that's on your bladder. So also, too, a case in point, I'll have patients who say, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night feeling I have to urinate. It's not that strong, but as soon as I stand up out of that bed, boy, if I don't run in that bathroom, I'm going to pee myself, right? And again, you sort of change the pressure that you put on your bladder, because when you're upright, that pressure ends up on top of your bladder and makes you feel like you have to pee. So um, that's, that's sort of the major issue. Is the bladder or enlarged prostate more responsible for OAB? Well, OAB is truly a bladder issue, but it may be because of enlarged prostate. So what I tell a lot of patients is this. So well, let's say we're, we're, we're going through our evaluation. And um, that's why the picture can be mixed a lot of times. So for, for, for case, you know, case in point, you may have a gentleman who has a very big prostate. He's had a very big prostate since he was in his 30s or 40s. I would say 40s or 50s. And over time, that bladder has gotten beaten up. And what I mean by that is that you've got a big prostate that's down here. You've got a bladder that's having to work really hard to empty itself. But the bladder is a muscle, right? So the bladder has been working real hard to empty itself. Over time, that bladder just becomes irritated. It just doesn't hold very much. It gets thickened. It gets irregular. And then you end up with this overactive bladder. Well, not necessarily because the bladder was the problem to begin with, because of this prostate. So in those mixed conditions, a lot of times the first thing to do is take care of the prostate, either by opening it up or putting on medications to control the prostate, and then working on the bladder. Because the bladder was fine, it's just that it's been pushing against this big prostate for years, that now you're, you're suffering from bladder dysfunction as well as obstruction. Thank you, Dr. Anglade. One more question. Is there a certain age limit for this treatment options? No, not at all. I mean, we can do it. We, these treatment options are, are eligible for anybody. And they work pretty well for anybody. You know, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the benefit of having new technology is that you find out where it's applicable. And again, these treatments are relatively easy to do. They're not major procedures, major operations. So for anybody, I think they're appropriate, any age group. And that brings us to the end of this evening's webinar. Thank you again, Dr. Anglade. If you have any questions or would like to schedule an appointment, we have several ways to help you do so. You can scan the QR code. For those of you who haven't had the pleasure of doing a QR code, it's the easiest way to schedule an appointment. Here's how it works. On your compatible Android phone or tablet, open the built-in camera, point the camera at the QR code on your screen, tap the banner that appears on your Android phone or tablet, and you will be directed to our scheduling window. Here you will be asked the reason for your visit, which you will type in webinar slash mailer for access to quicker appointments with Dr. Anglade. You can also visit the Georgia Urology website at www.georgiaurology.com and click on the orange schedule button. When prompted for the reason for your visit, type in the word webinar and mailer. You can also call the office at 770-979-9427. When you speak with an operator, make sure that you mention attending this webinar event and they will make sure to get you scheduled promptly. Uh, we also do have people from the call center who can uh, reach out to you directly as well and they will do so immediately following the presentation. If you have any questions, please email marketing at gaurology.com and Thank you all for coming this evening. And thank you again, Dr. Anglade, for your time and all the information. Well, Allie, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for anybody who 
listen to me for an hour. So I appreciate your attention and taking time out of a busy evening. And, um, you know, I hope you take the opportunity to come and visit. I just scanned the QR code myself on my phone. And so it comes up, so it does work. So please, if you want to make appointments, feel free to, to, to make an appointment. I'd love to talk some more overactive lab. So again, Ellie, thank you. And thank you for the people from Exonics for putting this together. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening.